Orville Austin Kirtland was born on June 22, 1919, in Lewiston, Idaho. Orville was the second child born to Lewis and Mabel Kirtland, and joined his sister, Ida, who was two years older than him. Lewis and Mabel came from Ohio and Minnesota, respectively, before moving westward to Lewiston. The move was successful for the couple as Lewis was able to support the family by working as a salesman for a local grocery store. The Kirtlands were a religious family, evidenced by the fact that Orville was baptized before his first birthday at Lewiston's Congregational Church. Though the family seemed settled, they left Lewiston by 1931. They did not go very far as they found a new home just a few miles north in Pullman, Washington. In Pullman, the Kirtlands found a community to settle down in. Additionally, Pullman was where Orville first began to emerge in the public record. Orville was very active in school and was listed frequently in newspapers because of his participation in various plays and musicals. Orville was also part of the local Boy Scout troop, making it to at least the rank of second class scout. As he began attending Pullman High School, Orville remained heavily involved with extracurricular activities. He was also part of the student staff of High Times, a bi-monthly student newspaper at Pullman High School, and served for at least three semesters. Orville also remained dedicated to his faith. On May 9, 1937, he was confirmed at the St. James Episcopal Church in Pullman. A few weeks later, he graduated from Pullman High School and looked at the local Washington State College for the next phase of his life. Going to school at Washington State College seemed like a logical step for Kirtland, as the school offered higher education close to home. Nevertheless, Orville also had potential career paths outside of college. In July 1937, he was noted as a guest at the Reserve Officers Association dinner at Fort George Wright in Spokane, Washington. It was reported that he was enrolled at the Citizens Military Training Camp and was also a candidate for commission in the Reserve Corps. As Orville was preparing to start classes at WSC in fall 1937, he was unaware of how important his involvement in the military would become in the future. As he began his first semester, Orville quickly got to work establishing himself on campus and amongst his peers. He studied law, but the workload did not stop Orville from becoming an extremely active student. First, Orville joined the Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity, a group he was a part of throughout his time at WSC. He was not satisfied with joining one group and split time with a variety of other interests. In November 1937, he was selected to the WSC freshman debate team. Despite only being a freshman, Kirtland did very well in his first year in debate and was held in high regard. In March 1938, he was one of nine pledges for the Forensic Circle, an honorary club which took members based on their performance in debate. Topping off his involvements, Kirtland was also involved in the school's ROTC program, being listed with the other non-commissioned officers that received appointments. Orville's first year at WSC was eventful and served as an indication of things to come. His next two years at WSC continued to be a happy time in his life. As he became more known around campus, his personal life emerged into view. This was demonstrated in amusing fashion in articles published by the Washington State Evergreen, the student newspaper. In the newspaper's gossip sections, Orville made a couple of appearances during his sophomore year. The first article reported that a Tri-Delta sorority member and Kirtland were seen together on the sorority porch, with Orville attempting to light matches by throwing them from the porch to the street. A few months later, Orville was mentioned along with fellow student Don Walker, as the article stated that the two always call on Virginia Harrison together. The article poked fun at the two men when it asked, is Orv giving Don his moral support, or is Don casting a supporting role to Orville? As he entered his junior year, Kirtland remained an active member with the debate club. In November 1939, he was named to the varsity debate team, showing his continued interest and skill. By the end of his junior year, Kirtland had compiled a long list of his accomplishments. Though he seemed primed to complete his education, Kirtland did not return for his senior year. The cause for his departure from WSC is unknown, though he remained in Pullman for another year. In March 1941, Disaster struck when Orville was involved in a head-on collision. Orville was the driver during the collision, but he and the three sorority sisters who were with him all survived and escaped with only minor injuries. 
Despite his brush with death, Kirtlin remained undaunted and committed to his plans. A few days later, on March 14th, Orville Kirtland enlisted into the U.S. Army Air Corps as a flying cadet. Shortly after he enlisted, Orville was sent to Oxnard, California for his initial training at the California Aeronautical Training Corporation. Though the United States was officially still neutral during early 1941, American leadership prepared for a conflict in the future. In the event of war, military planners knew that air power and thoroughly trained pilots would be crucial. During his initial training in Oxnard and secondary training in Bakersfield, Kirtland showed promise as a cadet and was sent to an advanced Army flying school at Lukefield, Arizona. By October 31st, Kirtland graduated along with 123 other cadets, six of whom were former WSC students. Now a fully-fledged pilot and stationed at Painfield in Everett, Washington, Kirtland was prepared for war. Unfortunately for Orville, his skills were needed sooner rather than later. After the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, Orville was quickly mobilized for war. He was immediately sent to Hamilton Field, California, and was one of the first American pilots to be sent overseas. By February 1, 1942, Orville had crossed the Pacific Ocean and had arrived in Australia. He was attached to the 40th Fighter Squadron, one of three fighter squadrons that was tasked with protecting Australia and the South Pacific from further Japanese expansion. The attack on December 7th was one of a series of attacks by Imperial Japan across the Pacific. From Hong Kong to Wake Island, Japanese forces swept aside all resistance as they captured valuable resources and created a buffer zone in the Pacific. Even with all this territory, Japan attempted to expand further. The city of Port Moresby, located in what is now Papua New Guinea, was a strategic location that put the Japanese within striking distance of the northern tip of Australia. With Japan menacing Australia, the US and its allies attempted to halt any Japanese incursions on Port Moresby. Countering Japan in the air was crucial for any chance of stopping the Japanese war machine. For aircraft, the three fighter squadrons received the P-400 fighter, a plane that possessed a deadly armament but was not nearly as fast or maneuverable as the famed Japanese Zero fighter. The battle was set as young, untested American pilots like Orville squared off against experienced Japanese airmen. Throughout his journey across the Pacific and during battles over Port Moresby, Orville managed to keep in touch with family as best he could, reassuring them with the cablegram in which he said he was still quite okay. Mother's Day in 1942 fell on his mother's birthday, and Orville was still able to send a cablegram from Australia wishing her both a happy birthday and a happy Mother's Day. Though he was able to keep in contact with family, Orville and the rest of the American pilots had their hands full fighting off Japanese planes. Raids on Port Moresby happened regularly, as Japanese bombers and their fighter escorts harassed the city on a consistent basis. It is unknown how many counterattacks Orville was involved in, but there were many opportunities to fight. Orville was renowned for his eagerness to fight, as a fellow pilot later wrote that, There wasn't enough fighting in this war to satisfy his love of flying and fighting. Unfortunately for Orville, his love of combat soon caught up with him. On July 11th, Kirtland and his squadron intercepted a group of Japanese bombers that were headed for Port Moresby. Kirtland completed his first attack on the bombers and attempted a second attack before he was intercepted by Japanese Zeros. His comrades lost sight of his plane during the battle, and unbeknownst to them, they would never see him again. Kirtland was initially listed as missing in action, as no plane or body was recovered in the days following the battle. By October 1942, Kirtland's parents were given the news that their son was officially listed as killed in action after months of searching turned up nothing. Orville's parents later received letters of condolences from high-ranking military officials, such as Henry L. Stinson and George C. Marshall. However, a letter from a fellow pilot was the most poignant. Orville was beloved by his comrades, and they grieved the loss of a trusted pilot. A fellow lieutenant wrote a letter to Orville's parents and spoke openly about his friend. Orville often said to me that when he left this life, he wanted to leave it in the sky, fighting. The letter continued, No pilot's loss was more heavily felt than your son's, not only among his fellow pilots, but also among the enlisted personnel of his squadron. We admired his courage and loved his happy outlook on life. We are proud to have had him as one of our number. Orville Kirtland was 23 years old at the time of his death. 
80 years after his disappearance, Orville's body has still never been recovered. Nevertheless, he was memorialized on tablets of the missing at the Manila American Cemetery in the Philippines. Fittingly, in the decades after his death, Orville's name was also included in the WSU Veterans Memorial in Pullman, 